Welcome in the latest episode of Five on the Floor on the Five Reasons Sports Network. Also can be found every day on the Nothing But Net channel on Dash Radio. That's a new thing, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Also check out FiveReasonSports.com. Spell it out, F-I-V-E, ReasonSports.com, where you will not find a paywall, but you will find all the latest columns, articles, trending news on the South Florida sports teams from the Heat to the Dolphins, Marlins, Canes, and Panthers, even into Miami as they try to finally win their first match. You can also find our merchandise there, our YouTube channel, and our other podcasts, including Three Yards Per Carry on the Dolphins, which will come back soon, and Five Rings Canes. Also check out all the great sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network. They are local, including Biscayne Bay Brewing, the official craft beer of Inter-Miami and the Miami Marlins, which is South Florida's actual independent brewery. Biscayne Bay is owned by local guys who employ people in this community to make their beer right here in South Florida. These guys are committed to our community and support Five Reasons Sports so we can keep bringing you all the local sports you can handle, again, for free. If you care about supporting local business and drinking amazing beer grab their stuff which is marlin's lager miami pale ale and tropical bay ipa at all major retailers throughout south florida it's the only beer that we're drinking at five reason sports again that's biscayne bay brewing official craft beer of inner miami the miami marlins and five reason sports and now today's special episode welcome to five on the floor a Miami Heat and NBA podcast from Ethan Skolnick with Alvon Sydney, a.k.a. ALF954. Brought to you by the Five Reasons Sports Network. Welcome back to Five on the Floor on the Five Reasons Sports Network. Mentioned that we had a special guest today. He's actually been on the podcast before, but these are certainly different circumstances. And we're going to start here. I've got Alphonse Sydney. We're going to have Alex Toledo with me as well. We're going to start here before we get to the basketball. We want to talk heat with you. We want to talk bubble. We want to talk where everything goes. But I simply have one question because I've been on Twitter since 2009. Um, it's been an up and down experience. Alf, for you as well, up and down experience? Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> I think for anybody who's been on Twitter for any significant amount of time, it's been an up and down experience. Yes. Um, I mean, at, at some point, I, I just hope they make the thing subscription only so that like nobody pays anymore and, and I could just find a reason to detach completely. Uh, you made a decision in 2020 during a pandemic uh, while obviously everything is going on with social justice in this country, while we've got the NBA coming back, to finally put yourself on Twitter, but not only put yourself on Twitter, but put yourself out there on Twitter. Like Alf and I were talking before we came on that you tweet more than both of us combined. And I thought he and I tweet more than anybody else on Twitter. Why? I guess that would be my question. Why now? Why did you decide to do it? What compelled you? Well, what compelled me is my wife and I um, have always been pretty involved politically. Um, but now, uh, number one, I have a lot more time. So, you know, I'm not coaching and in the pandemic haven't even been broadcasting. So you have a lot of time, but we were on a phone call with a candidate up here in central Florida for state's attorney in a, in a very important race, um, uh, Monique Warwell, Warrell in the uh, ninth judicial district up here. We were on with her advisors, her campaign staff some key supporters and you know they were talking about strategy in the campaign and so much came up about social media and I asked my wife my wife's on Facebook and Instagram you know all of that stuff but not on Twitter and I just said I asked her should should I get on social media to promote some of these candidates uh, and causes we're working for and she said yes and so that was the impetus. It was only a couple of weeks ago, not even quite two weeks ago, I don't think. And um, that's, that's why I'm on. Um, and, but look, I, I try to stay above the fray a little bit. I don't. This was recommended to me and I have the comments. So if people want to go on and, you know, bash me and the comments to my tweets and all of that, I'm not, I'm not reading that stuff. So um, it's been a positive experience for me so far. It doesn't mean it will stay that way. I understand that. I'm not naive. 
but so far it has been. And um, yeah, I intend to use it in this election season coming up. Uh, that's the main reason I'm on. So, okay. And, and Alf and I were talking about this too, is that we, we do read the comments because um, I, I, I find them entertaining. I, I read them on the bottom of people's tweets. And one thing that has surprised us is that because you do take, a, and, and look, I'm going to be very upfront here. I mean, there's a political view that you take that is shared by the three people. You know, I, I, can, I can speak to that for the most part um, that, that are on this uh, particular podcast right now. So we're not going to be the ones posting the negative comments on the bottom of your tweets. <laughs> I guarantee you that. But I have noticed that the majority of it is positive, uh, very positive. And, and I guess, uh, have you, you look, there are others in, in sports and, and others in the coaching profession, whether it's Steve Kerr, Greg Popovich, who've been outspoken. They've put themselves out there. It does seem like NBA coaches are more willing to do that than maybe coaches in other sports. You have always been willing. I guess I'll ask that other question. Why? I mean, have you ever been concerned about the backlash, whether it would prevent you from getting an opportunity, how you'd be viewed? Have you ever been concerned about that? I, I mean, I'd be lying if, if I said that I wasn't concerned. Um, you know, you, you always are, are concerned. And I think, you know, as you go on, maybe a little bit, less concerned as you get older. So I'm, I'm in an enviable position right now that financially I'm secure. And so if these things keep me from getting another job, I don't have to worry about it financially. So it's a little easier. Um, but I've, all, I've always felt that, you know, it, you almost have somebody like me, yeah, I have a platform and I have strong beliefs I've always felt like I have a responsibility to speak out on things and particularly on racial issues. Like my career has been made behind the, the efforts and the performances of players that are, you know, predominantly black and I've heard their stories. I mean, you know, my career from the start in college in, you know, 1981, I, two I've worked with is primarily black people, um, you know, players, other staff members, every, uh, yes, about the communities they came from and where they grew up, but even what is going on as they move into positions of prominence and to know those things and not speak up, I, I wouldn't be able to to live with myself. And, and I do think, you know, I can maybe hopefully reach a little different audience. Um, I hate to say it, but, you know, if people are hearing the same things from, you know, Doc Rivers or one of the players, you know, they can sort of or some people at least tend to sort of write it off as, oh yeah, this is just some angry black guy making an excuse, thinking he's getting screwed. And so I, I think for someone like me, who's had nothing but privilege in his life um, to be able to speak out, I think is not as important as black people speaking out, not as meaningful in my opinion, but at least reaches a little bit different audience, maybe. Well, Stan, as someone who's normally categorized as the angry black guy, thank you, because <laughs> uh, your voice is needed and it's, it's important and allies are always really important. So I really want to thank you for everything you've been doing on Twitter since you joined. Um, but you actually gave me like the perfect segue because as we go into the NBA a little bit, um, a lot of players have been outspoken. Adam Silver has been... Um, very supportive of the players wanting to speak out, wanting to be, you know, wanting to be represented. What do you think of the names on the jerseys, however? Because I kind of felt personally that it shouldn't have been as restrictive, um, but at least it's something. Where do you stand on the names, uh, the names, that, a.k.a. the slogans on the back of the jerseys? Well, here's one where I'm probably going to surprise you a little bit. I, I've got a couple of thoughts. The first is, I, I think the people who have criticized guys like LeBron who aren't going to have something on the back of their jerseys or the ones who are just going to have their name, I, I don't think that 
criticism is fair at all. I mean, you know, LeBron in particular, I think, has become more and more outspoken and has done a lot. And um, whatever he would do or not do on the back of his jersey um, means very little compared to the work he's put in. Um, but here's where I'm going to surprise you a little bit. Um, I'm actually, I was actually against um, the whole thing of putting things on the back of their jerseys. Like, to me, um, I think you always have to think about free speech issues um, as if you were in the minority, okay? And certainly racial injustice messages um, are coming from largely from the minority in this country, but not in the NBA. And I, I think free speech is paramount. I think it's what has allowed us to protest and change things in this country. And it seems to me that in this instance, the NBA is not promoting free speech. Like, if you're going to restrict the messages, um, you know, and not let people who have entirely different views promote a message on their, you know, the back of their jerseys, then I don't think we should be doing it. You're either going to let people use that forum to express political views or you're not. What if, what if somebody wants a, a pro-life view? on the back of their jersey or a pro-choice view. How, how are you going to say, if you're the NBA, that there are some issues we will let you speak out on and not others? And then even with, I, I know the NBA's response to that would be, no, we are going to speak out as a league, a predominantly black league, on racial injustice. Fantastic. But even with that, you're limiting the messages. They can't put the names of the victims on that. Are we only talking about injustice toward blacks? Can I put a message on there um, that's talking about the injustices we've done to Native Americans? Can I put immigration notices, you know, messages on there about the injustice we've, you know, foisted upon Hispanic people and others? So. I think it's a slippery slope in that regard. I think what the NBA had done previously was enough. Let the players speak out whenever they want. You know, they get a microphone thrust in front of them before and after every game, before and after every practice. They have plenty of opportunities to get their message out there. I think the jersey thing and things like that are a slippery slope. And when you're saying you can pick from these messages, I immediately get a little bit suspicious about that, and a little bit cynical that somebody is trying to control the messages somebody wants to get out there. So, you know, I, I think most people would think that I would be an ally of the messages on the back of the jerseys, and I'm not really. Stan, I think it's an interesting point you make about, you know, not really allowing all types of different social justice points have been made on the back of the jersey. I shared a similar opinion because I thought that it was kind of, you know, it seemed kind of generic for to try to push it into one of these, let's say, 10 picked out names. And I thought that's something that seems kind of, you know, for show and less to do actual action. And in that, I want to talk about the teams here because have we actually seen any teams put in money? Are we going to see any type of action from the teams. I think that's something that's that I'm looking for more because NBA teams are owned by billionaires, of course. And I wanted to know how you feel about that, about how the NBA can take action here other than, you know, just kind of putting names on the back of jerseys and T-shirts. I'm really glad I got that uh, question. Um, the, the NBA Coaches Association uh, was kind enough to uh, let me, even though I'm not coaching, um, sit in on some of their Zoom calls regarding this and it has been amazing to me um to see what the 30 coaches and their teams are willing to do and are doing already in their communities and it is all 30 of them i can guarantee you it's every one because i sit on these calls and i listen and so 
what happened in the first calls is they sort of decided what is it that we want to do and and they wanted to number one partner with groups on the ground grassroots groups who are interested in promoting racial justice and an end to police brutality they then got on calls with a lot of people who are experts in the uh in that arena, Rashad Robinson of Color of Change, the Obama Foundation, uh, Brian Stevenson from the Equal Justice Initiative. And what they came to was number one, let's promote education in our communities, racial education, because one of the things I think the coaches would all say, and I certainly would, is I thought I had a decent knowledge of the history of racial injustice in our country. And until these last couple of months, um, I didn't know anything. I realize now, like you learn more every day. And so Brian Stevenson made the point, you know, to the coaches that the place to start is to educate people. People need to know what has gone on in this country and what is still going on. And they're all working on those. Some have already done activities in their communities as much as you can virtually. Um, there have been obviously players and coaches out marching in their communities, but they have all partnered with groups and are setting up programs now that obviously will be able to be more extensive um, if and when we are ever able to get um, back into some sense of normalcy. But you're going to see all 30 teams in the NBA uh, working with groups in a very substantive, I have trouble with that word, substantive um, way. Um, on the ground working toward these things. It's been phenomenal to me. Lloyd Pierce of Atlanta has been the head of it, and he's been incredible. Um, but I have never seen an initiative, and not in my t time in the league, where the 30 head coaches have come together on something like this. Um, they're forging alliances with the Players Association. Um, I, I think you're going to see some very um, sustainable things come out of the NBA on this. I don't think it will. Um, be things that are around for a couple of months and then disappear. Um, they're trying to build some things that will last. And I think it's going to be important. Um, and I'm really proud of those guys and, and the work they're doing. Be back with Stan Van Gundy in a second. I want to introduce you to another of the great new sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network, and it is a sponsor that would be important in any time if you want to have a beautiful workspace, but it's especially important now when you need a safe one as well, and that's safecubbies.com, which offers modular office solutions designed to elevate your open office into a modern and safe environment at any budget. You can personalize your workspace with options like whiteboards, magnetic panels, acrylic sheets, and graphic branding. Most most of the surfaces are non-porous for easy cleaning and can be removed or replaced within minutes. Now, this is for workplaces. They've got a bunch of different options on their professional series, but also they've got private room solutions, dividers and sneeze guards, and they have a classroom series as well. So if you're involved with a school, this is definitely something your school should check out, of course, if we have school in the fall. And that's the point here. We are entering a new normal period with COVID-19, safecubbies.com, which is locally owned is the place that you want to go. The phone number is 754-216-1071. Again, that's 754-216-1071 or safecubbies.com. All right, Stan. So that gets to this particular question, which I think is the core question when we switch it here to basketball. Just simple. With everything that's going on with COVID, uh, with the social justice issues around the country, should the league even be playing at all? Well, I mean, I think that's a great question. And it's certainly one the league office had to wrestle with extensively and probably is still wrestling with on a daily basis, to be quite honest. I don't think Adam Silver in the league took this step lightly at all. Um, but as with the rest of the country, um, certainly – more so in the rest of the country, but there, there's economic issues. And so I think the players wanted to play. I mean, they were going to lose and still will, but they were going to lose an even more substantial amount of money if we didn't return to play. The owners wanted to play. 
uh, again, losing a lot of money. Um, the network certainly wanted to play. And so I think those three groups drove the decision of, hey, we want to play if there's any possibility that we can do it in a safe manner. And Adam Silver and the people at the NBA office got to work on constructing the safest possible way that this could be done. The amount of thought um, and planning that went into this, the attention to detail is absolutely incredible. And to me, if the NBA can't pull this off, if they can't make it through to completion, then nobody's going to be able to play sports in this country um, until we've either reached herd immunity, which will take at least a year, it sounds like, or a vaccine that can be widely distributed because nobody else can do what the NBA has done here. Um, it's really an unbelievable undertaking. And, you know, I've got my fingers crossed for them. I hope it works out. Um, but it's still very, very difficult. Even with everything they've done, all they need is one case, one guy who slips through on a false negative uh, on a day, has the virus, goes out and practices or plays around other people, and then it just spreads through the entire thing. I mean, what they're trying to pull off is – is very close to a miracle here. Um, and the only people that could possibly do this are the NBA. All right, Sam. So we know, so whether, whether we all agree they should come back or not, it, they are coming back. So um, in that vein, what do you, when we're a heat podcast, so, you know, our listeners want to know uh, about the heat and what their chances are. When you look at the team this year, um, you look at uh, their record, how well they've played at home. Now they're on a neutral court. What do you think of the Heat's chances in the playoffs and going forward uh, in this season? Well, Alphonse, look, I, I think the biggest thing to me is, is that this is going to be by far um, the most unpredictable postseason um, we've ever been through. I mean, we're normally – we will have seen a team through 82 games. We'll have seen the way they progress – will know going into it what their health is and, and everything else. We, we know none of that now because those first 64, 65 games are meaningless at this point in trying to make a prediction. There's, there's obviously going to be no continuity. We've had a four-month layoff. This is essentially a brand-new season. Um, and so we, we go into this, or at least I go into this, knowing very, very little, um, almost nothing. I don't know the true health of teams. I don't know how these guys who we've seen reports of that have tested positive, even if as they come back, I don't know what kind of lingering effects they're going to have, if it has affected their respiratory system or anything else. So I don't know how that's going to go. I don't know what the virus is going to do, if it's going to get inside the bubble. Um, I don't know what kind of shape these players have come back in in four months off. It'll differ widely across the league, and I don't know where the heat fits into that. And so, to me, I find it impossible to predict. I liked a lot of what I saw from the heat during the year. Um, I almost call it last season because it really is a different season. I liked a lot of what I saw, um, but it did seem to me as time went on um, that their defensive commitment started to lag a little bit, and that's going to need to come back closer to where it was earlier in the year um, for them to have a chance to be contenders. And in that vein um... – Obviously, you have a relationship with Eric, and one of the cases that I've made, even though I completely agree with you, I think we all do, that there's more unpredictability than we've ever seen before. It seems to me that there are certain things that will be important for teams that are in the bubble. So we've identified a few things. Uh, one of them is to have leadership on your roster, obviously, and, and I think they have that with, with Jimmy and some others. 
you know, one is to have depth because as you said, you don't know how certain guys are going to come back if they're going to go out. So you, you need, even Eric's talked about this, about the possibility he's going to have to play more, not just in the scrimmages, but all the way through the regular season games to kind of figure out what his new rotation is. But the other thing that it, it strikes me is going to be important is having a head coach who's willing to be flexible and put the pieces together with your knowledge of what Eric does how well suited do you think he is for this task? Look, I mean, you know, I, I'm not even sure with all of his success if the if Heat fans and the people in Miami un- understand um, how good Eric is. I, I mean, you know, I, I put he and Greg Popovich at the at the very top of the coaching tree in the NBA because they've proven. They can do it with different types of teams. They can get teams with, you know, marginal, mediocre talent to overachieve, as Eric did both before and after the LeBron James years in Miami. Um, You know, and they can coach the great teams and get them to the finish line. So Eric's, to me, along with Pop, I mean, those are are the two most – accomplished guys in the league. And and I think a real hallmark for Eric has been his adaptability. I mean, one of the things he's able to figure out is what he needs to do to maximize the performance of his team. He's done it in a personnel way, you know, struggled for a long time. Great example, I think, was Justice Winslow. Struggled for a long time with what to do with him. And then put him in that point guard spot. There is not anybody who thought of Justice Winslow as a point guard. But when he went to that position, he suddenly became a productive player. Eric's creative. Um, He will search ways to get the best out of players. He'll find a way to make his offense work. He's not afraid to try things. We saw out of him this year um, a lot more zone defense than what we'd seen. Um, yeah, he, he'll be one of the guys. He's not locked into one way of doing things. I think that will help them. I also think a big help for the Heat going into this whole thing, Ethan, is while the trend in the league has been to do less and less and less in terms of practice, um, game day walkthroughs, just less work in general. It's become a rest league. Um, The Heat are still very much a work team. And I think that's going to help them in the fact because I think getting guys up to speed, getting your team well conditioned to go through this after a four month layoff has going to be, is going to be key. And the Heat, as you know, um, are, obsessive about conditioning and I think they'll do as good a job as anybody in the league in getting that part right and I think that'll also be huge when you talk about personnel uh, when you look at the heat they've relied heavily on young and unproven guys uh, guys who haven't don't have a lot of playoff experience guys have only been elite in the league one or two years guys like Duncan Robinson Kendrick Nunn um, Bam Adebayo is younger but he's been around a little bit longer um Usually you would think that in a playoff situation that these guys would not be your best bet as far as relying on them. But with this, with this situation the way it is, do you think that uh, that is a benefit to younger players or is this going to be even more of uh, a detriment to guys who are not used to this kind of atmosphere? That's a great question and really tough to answer because we've never – We've never seen this, um, this kind of situation. Normally, you know, I mean, any coach given their druthers, um, you don't want to have a lot of real young guys in their first playoff experience. I mean, you'd, you'd, you'd rather not, um, you know, but the Heat have enough veteran guys and their younger guys are tough, competitive, hardworking guys. Look, I, I think the Heat's success this year in their roster – um, is largely in part, or is largely because of h- how well they've done in evaluating talent. I- I've said this several times, said it on NBA TV, um, 
you know, obviously I was in that organization for a while, so I have some knowledge, but there's no better player personnel person in the league than Chet Kammerer. To, in my mind, he is the premier talent evaluator in the league. And I think his role in the Heat success over the years, and he's been there since I've been there, um, and I came in in 95, and he's been there since then. His role in the Heat thing has been, I, I would say, underplayed, but it actually hasn't been played up at all because Chet's not a guy – who promotes himself. But if you just, the guys that he has been able, I mean, I go back to, you know, Malik Allen and Mike James and Udonis Haslam. I mean, Chet Kammerer found those guys, you know, he found those guys, Eddie House. And now you get into Duncan Robinson, you know, and the other young guys that they have, Hey, that they have got, right? And these are guys that were out there for the taking for other people, and Chet found them. And Chet sold them to, to Pat and to Eric, and they know enough to trust, to trust Chet. And they put together a roster of young guys that were clearly ready to play and could play a role. And then you give them to Eric Spolstra, who will find the best way to make the talent work. I mean, it's incredible. I, I mean, what they have done, Bam Adebayo is an all-star. I mean, look, what, what, what they have done in their organization with this group has been uh, nothing short of phenomenal. And it starts with talent evaluation because these weren't guys that were picked like in the top five in the draft. Stan, I think that's a great point you make. And to go along with the Czech camera love, Josh Richardson, I remember he was the one that found Josh Richardson, unearthed him, and, you know, they got him with a 40th pick, turned out to be just as productive as Justice Winslow, sometimes more productive. They ended up flipping him for Jimmy Butler last offseason. So I think that goes along with your point. But to stick with the heat there, so they're going into this playoff run now, uh, let's say as the four or the five seed. How much would you pin their chances at a, at a conference finals run? You know, the heat, like you mentioned before, with their defensive issues, kind of – maybe puts them just a little bit under the teams like the Raptors and Celtics who finished ahead and are more two-way teams. Do you buy the Heat as somebody who can beat one of those teams or get to the conference finals and maybe even upset the Bucks along the way? Well, that would be the challenge, right? I, I, I think that um, Miami's a good team. Um, I think it'll be, you know, the first round, will be, depending on who they play, it'll probably be like – 50-50 proposition. You know, if they end up with where they are now and play Indiana, I would actually favor the Heat, uh, particularly on neutral court, um, especially not knowing where Oladipo is going to fit into the thing. But we don't know that they'll end up there. Um, I think beating Milwaukee in the second round would be a bit of a long shot. I certainly don't think impossible, um, but I think my, Milwaukee would have to be heavily favored um, in that thing, uh, look, Milwaukee has been clearly the best team in the league, you know, all year long, unless they have been, you know, affected more substantially than other teams in the East by this layoff. I still think they're the, uh, odds on favorites in the East, but, um, it wouldn't be a, uh, blowout series. I, I don't think that. I mean, I think the Heat would win a game or two. I think the games in large part would be competitive, but I would have a hard time, you know, again, going back to March, seeing the Heat beat Milwaukee in a series. Now, we're not in March, so maybe the Heat guys did more work than the Buck guys. Um, and by the time we got to the second round, the Bucks haven't made up that gap. I mean, there's always a possibility, and there's certainly a possibility that injuries or the virus or something else um, sends an edge back to the Heat's way. But in March, um, I wouldn't have been able to see the Heat beating Milwaukee in a series. Right, we're going to finish up here with some rapid fire after this message from one of our sponsors. 
We'll get back to our episode in a second, but first I want to tell you about another of the great local sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network and Five on the Floor. That's right. All of our sponsors are local. All of them are South Florida sports fans, including Mark, who's a rabid Heat fan. You can find him at youbreakwheelfix.com, or the physical address is just south of Aventura in North Miami. 15 years of experience in wheel repair and refinishing. They do repair of cracked, bent, curbed, and damaged wheels, and they also do refinishing and powder coating back to factory specifications along with, and this is the really cool thing, over 5,000 available custom colors. They do themed wheel colors after your favorite South Florida teams, including the vice colors for the Heat and the colors for the Dolphins. We've posted some of those on our social media platforms. You can find You Break Wheel Fix. That's the address across Twitter, IG, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Again, the website is youbreakwheelfix.com. 305-748-0112. That's 305-748-0112. And tell Mark that Five on the Floor sent you. And now, back to today's episode. All right, Stan, I want to get to some more fun stuff with you here. Um, Before we talk about Chips Ahoy, uh, I do have have some stuff related to a a team that actually, we did an, an episode about the most memorable seasons in Miami Heat history. And we were trying to come up with the five most memorable seasons. And I was trying not to limit it to just the three championships because that's too easy. Um, But the season that always comes up from Heat fans is 03-04 because it was one of the the least expected. And and I remember that first couple weeks of the season where there were articles written about, is this one of the worst teams of all time? Uh, And you guys ended up going 42-40, and making the second round of the playoffs and pushing Indiana to six games. Do you have one favorite memory from 0304? Is is there one game, one circumstance, one interaction with a player that when you think of that season, that's what you think of? Well, I have a lot of thoughts on that season, you know, and and a lot of good memories. That was a tremendous group of people and a lot of fun to coach. Uh, I I enjoyed the staff, Bob, Keith, Eric. I mean, it was just a uh, tremendous season. But if you're going to give me one, it would be, Game one of round one of the playoffs, Dwayne Wade as a rookie hitting a game winner in his very first playoff game. I mean, I I don't know how many people have done that um, and then gone on to the kind of careers Dwayne's gone on to, but it it seems like looking back now that it was uh, just a sign of things to come um, for the best player in Heat history. I mean, it was – an incredible moment. I I still remember the arena on that night. Um, You know, how loud it was. You couldn't hear anything. And for him to make that shot. Yeah. I I don't know that, um, that I have a better memory from that season than that. Well, take me in that huddle then, because I I was sitting baseline for that. I mean, I, it's, it's the one, it's the only heat action photo I have in my apartment uh, because it's right before Dwayne releases the ball and we're all sitting there on the baseline. Like, is he really going to take this shot? What went into the thought process of basically just, I mean, as Tony, I guess said on the telecast, you know, he gave it to the rookie and, and he delivered what, what went into that? Well, I'll tell you what, you know, that that's interesting, but that whole thing on, on deciding who to go to um, at the end started all the way back in summer league that year. Um, You know, we we were playing in Summer League against LeBron James' Cleveland team in the Orlando Summer League. So, you know, no fans there or anything like that. And the game comes to the wire, and we get in a very similar situation in a Summer League game. I wasn't the head coach at that point, so I was coaching the Summer League team. And Dwayne did roughly the same thing. Took the clock all the way down and hits the game winner. And we had had a couple of instances – during the year of putting Dwayne in that situation. And I have said this repeatedly. There isn't a guy that I've seen. I don't care. Go through the greatest players in league history. And I know I'm biased. There's no one that I have seen that I would rather give the ball to in those situations, in that kind of situation than Dwayne Wade. Um, Because, he obviously he has what all of the great players in those situations need to have his ability to create a good shot on his own. Um, you know, the fearlessness to take the shot and the ability to, 
to make it. He has all of those. But to me, the, when the game is tied, it's a little bit of a different situation because you want only one of two things in, those situ, in that situation. You want to get the bucket and win the game or you want to go to overtime. So the fact that he can get a shot and make it, that's all well and good. But he can't take the thing with four seconds on the clock and he misses, they call timeout, advance it, and then they get the ball coming back and you got a chance to lose it. The timing of things has to be just right. And Dwayne, not through any teaching of me, I know that, understood that and could get the clock to that point every time. So I knew we were going to get the last good shot in that game. Now, Dwayne didn't do as good a job as he normally does in game one. He left them with, what, three-tenths or four-tenths left. So that's actually the most he ever left anybody with in those (laughs) situations. But that's a very difficult situation. And so we had learned that starting in summer league, built on it during the year. And there was just nobody that I had more confidence in then. And there's nobody I've ever had more confidence in since that point. Stan, you talk about having Dwayne as a rookie and seeing what he's grown into now. Let's talk about the season right after 2004, 2005. The Heat traded for Shaq. All of a sudden, there's championship expectations with D-Wade in the second year, and he absolutely performs like it, right? He, he makes his first All-Star team, and you guys win, what is it, 54 games that year? 54 and 28? No, 59. 59 games that year. But who's yeah. counting? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what I wanted to ask is, before the injury stuff that happened there in the conference finals, how confident were you? And I know you guys, as a coach, as players, you guys take it one possession at a time, one game at a time. You're not looking too far ahead. But how confident were you that with not, you know, with those injuries not happening, that you guys could have really won the championship that year? Well, I'm not going to, you know, blame it on the injuries. We, we had our guys when we needed them, um, you know, in game seven. But, um, look, I – we knew we were playing the defending champions um, in the conference finals. I thought and, and was very confident and am still of the belief that we had the better team. Um, you know, to me, the real disappointment was, was game one, losing that. That, that was the most disappointing to me. Um, you know, and, you know, then some things went on and, and, you know, we won a big game five, went and played a man down in game six, came back home game seven and couldn't get it done on our uh, on our home floor. I mean, it, it's still – I appreciate you bringing it up because every time I think about it, now I have to be depressed for at least 24 hours. I'm sorry. Um, so, I, so I appreciate that. Yeah. No, but it just – it was a tough one because, you know, it's always disappointing to lose in, in those kind of situations, but – in that one, maybe more so because, you know, I, I just felt we had the better, we had the better basketball team, and we didn't prevail there. I give them a lot of respect. Obviously, they were defending champions, and then you know beat us to go to the finals. So I give them a ton of credit. Larry Brown, one of the best coaches in the history of the game. I'm not trying to take away anything from them. I, I just thought we were the better team. I thought we were the best team in the league. And there's not very many times that you're in those situations as a coach. Um, And so you'd certainly like to take advantage of those opportunities when you get them. And, you know, we didn't get the job done. Did you feel that way more about that team maybe than the one you did take to the finals uh, with Orlando? Maybe more about that 05 Heat team that they were the best team in the league than, than the Orlando team that you ended up going up against the Lakers in the finals? Probably similar. Um, I, I thought that um, I thought that we were better than the Lakers uh, during the regular season in in '09. We had played them twice during the year, and you know I never put you know the regular you know what happened in the regular season um, as a great predictor of what's going to happen in the playoffs. But having played them, I thought we were better. Sort of the wild card in that team in that one anyway was the biggest reason we beat them, or at least one of the biggest reasons we beat them twice in the regular season in 09 was 
you know, Jameer Nelson just shredded them during the regular season. And then Jameer missed the first three rounds of the playoffs, and we brought him back in the finals and played him off the bench um, in every game. Um, basically because I knew that had been our major edge and thought maybe we could recapture some of that. Um, we couldn't. And with Jameer simply being a backup and not really ready uh, to do what he had done in the regular season, we didn't have a lot of answers um, for them in the finals. I, I will say this. Um, the difference to me is um, I felt like – we were the better team in, in 05. Um, even as I walked out of the building that night, I thought we were the better team magic against the Lakers in 09 going into the series, but coming out of the series, at least where we both were in terms of health and everything at that point, um, the Lakers were the better team. So that was a little bit difference, I guess. You were also the first coach that Udonis Haslam ever had in the NBA. And, uh, He's no longer the oldest player in the league, I guess, because Jamal Crawford came back, uh, although UD says he's still the sexiest player in the league, which uh, is a pretty typical UD comment. I guess going back to that original summer league, and I know he was on another summer league team, and uh, you know he ended up with San Antonio, I guess, and you guys had to make sure you got him. I mean, it's been 20 years, Stan, almost. Uh, are you... <laughs> Are you just, and, and not only that, but he's emerged as a community leader um, in a lot of ways. And I mean, I thought he gave one of the more powerful speeches during everything that was going on a couple months ago. Can you put into context what UD's career has been? I mean, it's almost hard to put in context. It's been so phenomenal. I mean, you know, this is a guy that has just won everywhere. I mean, you know, he won at Miami senior in high school. He won at the university of Florida and he goes through both of those experiences and was one of the best college players in the country and doesn't get drafted and has to go overseas and lose weight and come back. And then after all of that, he's starting as a rookie on opening night. Like what's going on here? You know, like this guy, is, is somebody that his teammates and coaches are always going to trust. And he only plays the game for one reason, and that's to win. It's never about numbers. Um, it's never about him or awards or anything else. It's just whatever he needs to do at any given moment to help a team win. And, and this is one of the things I was trying to point out with Chet Kammerer. You know, player evaluation is not just about talent and what you see on the court. It's about trying to project what somebody's going to be like and what kind of worker they're going to be and what kind of character they have and how unselfish they are and all of that. Udonis Haslam is the epitome of that. You know, you went out and got not only a really good player, but one of the highest character guys we've ever had in this league. Um, and again, he was there for the taking for anyone, but Chet Kammerer saw it in him. And then we saw it in him in summer league and were fortunate enough to get him. Um, and then the career he has had. And, and I think the most amazing thing, and you guys know this better than I do, because, you know, you've stayed with it. I had you down for two years and then moved on and tried to figure out how we beat his teams. But you guys have stayed around him. Um, I think what speaks highest about Udonis Haslam is the reverence that his teammates have for him. I mean, you, you hear it from every one of them from his rookie year. We'll talk to Shaq and others about Udonis as a rookie all the way up till now where he sort of progressed through being a, a leading guy, a starter, key key guy off the bench to now playing very little the reverence has never gone away and he has earned the respect of everyone in Miami with the way he's conducted his career and lived his life that's what's made him a community leader right is mean is people look they know who Udonis Haslam is they've watched, literally in Miami they've watched this guy grow up They've watched his entire life come up through Miami. They trust him. So when he speaks out, 
You have to listen to Udonis Haslam. Stan, I wanted to ask here, go back to the heat here. You, you talk about Udonis Haslam and two guys who are basically their centerpieces now, Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo, kind of follow in that same mentality that you were describing, just people who are high character and who the Heat have identified as, you know, extremely hard workers, which has been by all reports the case for Jimmy and Bam. And I think they've kind of been, uh, to say it nicely, they've been carrying the defense all year for a lot of other guys who, yes, have been great finds for the Heat, but have struggled a little bit on defense. Is that something that you see that they can really heal during this whole time, or at least because they were about a league average defense before the season shut down. Do you think there's another gear now that they have Andre Iguodala and Jay Crowder and Solomon Hill, the guys they traded for at the trade deadline, you know, maybe they can move Jimmy into a kind of defend the point of attack guard at some points during closing stretches and move Iguodala to the wing to kind of do more looks like that. How much would you trust the Heat's versatility based on what you see with their roster since the trade deadline? Well, they've got great versatility, not only their roster being versatile, but they've got a very adaptable head coach. So they've got great versatility. I think they certainly have the potential um, to defend at a very high level, you know, uh, a top quarter of the league type of defense. Um, We saw stretches of that during the uh, initial part of the season, Um, but it definitely dropped off. And and so we just – God, I'd love to give you guys better predictions based on what I've seen. But, you know, even though their defense had dropped off, that was four months ago. So I have no idea. Like, there's no continuity from four months ago. We can't take anything from that. And so it's all down to what kind of conditioning are they bringing back to Orlando and what kind of mentality are they bringing back. I do know, like I said earlier, this is an organization that values – work and that values defense um, and values toughness. Um, they, they do it in their player evaluations. They do it in the way they coach their teams. And I think that that's going to help them a great deal in this run up. And I, I think we'll see the heat play at a pretty high level. All right. Um, two quick ones and we'll get you out of here. Uh, the first one is we do need a prediction on this because this is a heat podcast. And as you know, with Heat fans, it's never about who you have, but it's about who's coming next. Where do you think Giannis is playing in two years? Well, if I had to bet, I would say Milwaukee, but I don't have any knowledge. I've never once had a conversation with uh, Giannis. Um, I haven't talked with Mike Budenholzer about that or with anyone else in the organization. But if I had to bet, I would say Milwaukee. I, I, I think he's a different type of guy. I don't think he's the same as everybody else in the NBA by any means. Um, you know, you can see that he's not real collegial. He doesn't want to work out with guys on other teams in the off season. Except he's Bam. Still, Except Bam. Except Bam. <laughs> he wants to, you know, I think he cares very much about the team he's on. Um, yeah, and I think a lot of it, you know, in fairness, comes down to how, they'll, how they're able to fare in the playoffs the next couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, but if that all goes well, I, I think he stays, uh, he stays in Milwaukee. I certainly hope so, um, from a league perspective, because, you know, the, as the player movement is picked up and, and I like the fact that the players are empowered to create situations for themselves. I, I think that's a, a good thing. Um, but you know, the cities they're going to pick are going to be, you know, the better weather cities and the bigger markets and everything else. And I think it's getting harder and harder and harder um, for the teams like Milwaukee and the smaller markets. And I would like there to uh, remain some hope for those kinds of cities that they can keep their stars and build uh, contending teams. All right. So the hottest take that you had of all your hot Twitter takes uh, over the past uh, two weeks has been related to Chips Ahoy. Uh, and your selection when you go to the grocery store. Um, c- can you give me, a, if, I, if I'm not a particularly big fan of Chips Ahoy, can you give me a second cookie? Is, is, there, is there another option there that I can go for? Well, I mean, uh, the thing is, is that this isn't even controversial. I mean, Chips Ahoy are clearly the best. If we're talking store-bought cookies now, I mean, there's all kinds of places you can go to bakeries or make at home and make better. But what, the discussion I had on Levitard's show was, you know, store-bought cookies. So there's really not a second choice. 
Now, I guess if I got to the store and everything was sold out, Chips Ahoy was sold out, I'd probably go to another grocery store. But <laughs> if I had to stay at that store, I mean, you stay with the classics. I mean, you probably go with, you know, Oreos. I mean, you know, you, you just... I mean, that's, Stan, that's true. my choice. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, tried look. and true. That, see, if people had argued with me and brought up Oreos, I'd say, okay. You know, but... And I had one guy, a local writer here in Orlando, that was trying to argue with me about Nutter Butter. Like, no. like no. I follow this guy. He's a political columnist. Ridiculous. He's one of the best anywhere. And I, I told him, I said, I, I just don't know if I can look at you with the same respect I've had for you for 13 years now. On one, on one tweet there, I, I, you know, I was out. I might not even listen to him on politics anymore because now I'm questioning his judgment. Well, I would too, because a lot of children are allergic to peanut butter also. So not only is it a bad choice from a taste perspective, but it's dangerous. I mean, it's almost as dangerous as putting the kids back in school right now. You cannot be giving, I learned that lesson when I packed that, packed the peanut butter snack. All right. So I'm going with Oreos. You can go with Chips Ahoy. Um, I guess the final thing we let you, do you, do you want to coach again? Is that something you still want to do? Yeah, I, I would like to, um, you know, I don't get to make that decision <laughs> unilaterally, obviously. Um, some team has to come to me and, uh, you know, and, and give me that opportunity. But yeah, I would, I would love to, I mean, I, I'm still, um, fairly young and I think I've got a lot to offer. Um, and, and I would love to get another opportunity, but I don't control that. I'm not spending a lot of time worrying about it. I, I'd like to get a chance, but if not, I'm, I'm full speed ahead on, uh, trying to get better with the broadcasting, um, you know, and, and trying to learn as much as I can on that side of it and uh, looking forward to getting to, to do that work in Orlando. Um, we've got the very first game on July 30th. Mm -hmm. I and Eagle and I have the uh, Utah New Orleans game on uh, July the 30th. So first time you can turn on an NBA game after this big layoff, you get to listen to me. Now, whether that makes you want to tune in or not want to tune in, I don't know, but that's who you get. I thought they were going to say you get to see this face and this UM hat, as long as you wear the UM hat that you wear it here. Uh, oh, that would be pretty good, wouldn't it? That would be pretty good in, in honor of your daughter. Well, I can tell you there's an opening to coach the Five Reasons uh, media uh, basketball team. I actually had to coach it last oh, time. I, I think we advanced two rounds, right? I was waving my hands. Oh, we can use the help. We could use the help. So if nothing else comes across in the next year, provided that, again, we're allowed to be around each other again, you can certainly coach that team. I'll see you up in Orlando, but I don't think they're going to let me talk to you because I'm one of those tier two media that uh, have to stay somewhere up in the bubble. But, Stan, we appreciate you doing this. Please don't stop tweeting, and, uh, and obviously we'll check in with you on July 30th uh, on that game coverage. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it, guys. Thank you for listening to The Five on the Floor on the Five Regional Sports Network.